Oh, let's go, church. Oh, hey, college kids, welcome back. Hashtag college and corona. Hey, there's some thoughts out there that maybe it'll be a downer year. Man, I just say forget that. It's the best year of your life. Christ doesn't stop being with us in corona, so he's on the throne. It's good news. Want to say welcome. Hopefully figuring out online versus not online, all that was great. Uh, My name's Austin. I am the college pastor, and so I just want to say I see you, and we're really glad you're here. Uh, For everyone else, hey, welcome to church, Antioch Community Church. Here at Antioch, we are passionate for Jesus and his purposes on the earth, and I hope our desire, if you're logging in to the interwebs, if you're outside or here this morning in person, man, that you would experience Jesus, because that's a hashtag game changer, yeah? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it kind of changes. It changes everything, man. He is so good, kind, merciful, patient, and he's with us in everything. And so I hope you experience that this morning. Um, If you're visiting with us, we have this thing called Life Group. If you're interested in getting connected, we have this fancy email. Get it. Ready? Connect. Yeah, that's good, huh? Yeah. At AntiochFC.org. Just drop them a letter, uh, uh, email, electronic letter, and we would love to help you get connected. Or you can find us right out that door after the service. Or just ask the person that brought you, hey, who are you with? Where do you do Life Group? And we'd love to help you get connected. All right. Well, hey, why don't you uh, uh, stand, and I know we got these shields going on, but try and like go through the shields and acknowledge a few people. Just give them a little smile, maybe a little eyebrow raise. I'm glad you're here. Well, hey, as we uh, prepare ourselves for worship, one of our values around here is called courageous generosity, and we love to worship Jesus with all of us, our time, energy, money, everything. And so we'd love to invite you, if you're trying to figure out how to give, specifically if you're online, I know you guys have all used the interweb, that's the most effective way, and so we'd love to invite you to continue to give and what that looks like for you. All right, as we step in. I was reading this text in the book of James, James 1. It says, consider it pure joy when you face 2020. Okay, that was Austin's interpretation. Consider it pure joy when you face trials, tribulations, because the testing of your faith is working out perseverance that we be mature and complete, lacking nothing in Christ. And so if, if 2020 is happening to you, and you're maybe not necessarily happening to 2020, I want to invite you into worship this morning. Okay, Jesus, I want to put this to the test and say thank you. I want to step into your presence and say thank you for what you're doing. You're worthy. You're worth it. Would you meet me in 2020? Would you meet me in the trial, in the tribulation? So would you do that with me, church? Come on, would you do that with me, church? Come on, let's do it. All right, Jesus, you're on the throne. We say you're good. You're good. You're good. You're good. Jesus, I say we are not a victim to 2020, but we say we will worship you in 2020. And so, Jesus, we step in. We step in. Have your way.
build every wall You watch the giants fall For you cannot survive when we praise you We gotta break through on our side Forever lifted up With all creation cry God we praise you Yes we praise you Jesus You're worthy of it all We lift you up Jesus
Yeah. Gosh, how good is Jesus? So good. I was just thinking that I did this last service too, and he's still just as good. And it feels like so amazing in my heart, and that kind of hit me just now. So join me in that. <laughs> Um, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Emma Janelle. I'm the director of Kids Ministry here at Antioch. And we got to do something really, really special this morning. This morning was our promotion Sunday. Promotion Sunday is the day when the kids move up in age group to their next classroom and start their new adventure with God. Um, so that included all of our kids who moved into our 3 through pre-K classroom, our kindergarten through first grade classroom, our second through fifth grade classroom, and all of our kids who moved up into youth ministry this year. So we got to celebrate them, which was so fun. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to take a minute and we're going to pray over those kids. And as we as a ministry were praying, we have felt like the word over the kids this year is just joy that throughout this last season that's been so crazy, what we've learned is that our kids are so resilient. And they've come out of all of these weird situations laughing and exploring and adventuring. And so we're gonna pray for more of that over this time. So go ahead and pray, grab a person and pray. There are 16 kids that are promoting today. So if you can think of any of them, get them in your brain, and then I'll come back and finish this out. the ones who are encountering you, the ones who are learning to love you. God, we just ask for more of you this year. Um, we know that your heart is for kids to come to you, to seek you, to see you, to taste more of you. God, that we are raising up the next generation of people who are going to share your word. And so God, we just thank you for them. We ask for joy to be abundant in them, for discovery to be abundant in them. Well, guys, we have a very special announcement. Our kids' ministry is going to be opening back up on the 13th of September. I know. I'm so excited. We're going to be doing outdoor um, ministry for our elementary age students and above. So if you know anyone with a kid, let them know. And um, if you would like to be connected to our ministry and you haven't been connected to our ministry yet, you can email me at kids at antiochfc.org or I'll be outside near next after the service. Thanks, guys.
flesh is weak, there's times my heart grows cold, and there's a prayer that we can pray to, God, keep me within your love, help me in my weakness, that I would know your love, and so I just want to stay in that moment, if you're in that place, go, man, I'm feeling a little cold right now, I'm feeling a little hard-hearted, maybe I'm just, you know, a little distracted, I don't know that I want to be here, just pray that prayer over yourself, God, keep me within your love, let me know your love more here this morning. And so just do business with God right now. And I'll close this out in prayer in just a minute, but let's not miss a moment where we can just go, God, my flesh is willing, um, or my spirit's willing, but my flesh is weak. Help, help right now. Just pray that for yourself. Help. Keep us in your love. God, pour out your love on us right now. God, in all the places where there's challenges in our hearts, God, or where we haven't let you into certain areas, God, would you come with your love? Would you change us? Would you convict us, God? Fill us with your love again. Keep us in your love. In Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and make your way back to your seats. Welcome. This is probably the biggest crowd we've had in a while, so glad you guys are here. Good morning. You guys excited to be at church? Woo! All right. Well, hey, just like any Sunday where we are wearing masks, which has been now for a while, it is hard for me to see your faces, so I'm going to need some fist pumps, uh, some claps, some amens, uh, just to get some feedback. Can we do that? All right. So just ask for a little bit of energy here this morning. Cool. Well, hey, I want to start off by reading this passage um, out of Ephesians chapter 3, and that'll lead us into what we're talking about today. But the reason I want to read this passage because there's a few passages in the Bible that I would consider to be otherworldly. Like you read it and you're like, man, I don't even know what that means. It sounds awesome, super deep. Uh, it's talking about angels and demons and spiritual places and all that stuff. That's amazing. But what does that mean? And I want to read this because it's talking about the church in it, which is going to be our subject matter for the next few weeks. But this is Ephesians 3, 8 through 10. 
This is Paul talking. He says, to me, though I'm the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. That word manifold uh, there uh, is also where we would use, or the Greek word we would get, uh, uh, multifaceted. It would be the idea that a diamond has a lot of different sides. And so that you would look at one cut of that diamond, and inside you'd see beauty, you'd see splendor. And then you could change that diamond, you could change the perspective, and you could see something new. Totally unique, but also a part of of that diamond. You would see its beauty, its splendor in all the different sides. What Paul is talking about here is that through the church, the wisdom of God, the unfolding of this mystery of salvation and of creation and how God is reuniting his people back to himself is something that angels and demons are being, it's being revealed to them. Those are the rulers and authorities in heavenly places in our understanding of the created order. Um, That's being revealed to them through us. Isn't that amazing? Like, whoa. What does that even mean? I don't know, but it sounds awesome. (laughs) That as we do life together in church and we are the body represented to the world, the body of Christ, as we are living stones being built together into a temple that houses the very presence of God, where two or three are gathered, there I am, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Like when that truth gets realized through the church, angels and demons go, well, that's his mystery. It's being revealed right now. And for angels, it's to his glory and to the enemy. It's like, dang it. Man, we thought we had a plan, and now the church is screwing it up because of the manifold wisdom being revealed right now. Doesn't that sound amazing? So here's, we're talking about the church in this season because we're talking about getting a perspective from God's point of view of uh, what's going on in the earth and how we see from his perspective. And then we're first talking about our perspective on the church because I think oftentimes when we think about the church, we think about a meeting, think about some songs, some clapping, maybe a few laughs. Uh, if I make some jokes, maybe some, something good was preached. But truthfully, the, the body of Christ is the agent of change on the planet Earth. It is how Jesus is working his good purpose out in humanity. And as we choose to represent him to the world, it says that the gates of hell cannot stand against it. That we are a force for heaven on the earth when we do life together. And so we at Antioch have a way of describing what we believe church looks like or the structures that hold the life that we're talking about there. And we call them the five circles of church. The first one's me and Jesus. It's me and one or two. It's me and a small group community. It's me corporately, the big C church. Uh, and it is us on mission. It is me on mission with the church. And so today we are starting with our first circle, which you can see this up on the wall right here. It's me and Jesus. You and Jesus and how you think about Jesus is the beginning of the church. Now, I want you to look at the chandeliers above us. Man, isn't it great that God just knows how to design a room to fit with my illustrations? Thank you, Jesus. So right here, you see a chandelier. It's got three circles. I want you to imagine that it has five circles. And if that chandelier was... You guys good to do that? Okay, good. All right. If that chandelier was to come down on the ground and it was to be uh, supported by that bottom circle, this is what it looked like. It looked like an inverted pyramid or an inverted cone, right, with the top cut off. The smallest circle is the foundation for that chandelier. The smallest circle of the church, me and Jesus, is the foundation of the church. That if me and Jesus aren't right, if we're not working things out together, if I'm not following him, then I can't truly build the church. I can't be that member of the body that God's called me to. I can't be that living stone that he is building me into with the rest of the church into a place where his temple dwells. We have to get this one right. Otherwise, it won't work. You hear me? Amen. All right. Good. So Matthew chapter 16. Actually, let me jump back just a little bit here because this is important. I think one of the most beautiful things about the church is the fact that you and I can have nothing in common apart from Jesus, and that's enough. So, like, I don't like the activities you like. I'm not into the hobbies you like. We're not in the same life stage. And yet we can do life together, and because he's the most important thing to both of us, you and I now form this deep, bonding, life-giving relationship. And what I've really enjoyed is seeing this played out in life group when uh, specifically we do a Super Bowl party as a life group. And no matter what, who's invited to that, there's always this one person in life group that's like, I don't watch football. I don't know who's playing. 
know what I'm talking about? They're like, I'm just here for the food and the fellowship. Like, seriously, I could care less about this game. And me, I'm sitting here, and I'm like, I know who the third-string quarterback is for both teams. Like, I know everything about this. And I'm like, this person is just like, eh, whatever, I don't really care. And it's like, and they're, they're enjoying the commercials more than enjoying the game, right? <laughs> but there's something in us that has bonded so deeply that I'm like, there's no one I'd rather watch this game with. There's no one I'd rather spend time with. You might not be paying attention. I might be paying complete attention. And I want to watch this game with you because we form this relationship that is deep and significant to me. See, that's the beauty of the church, that he's the most important thing to us. And so when we're hanging out and we're talking, we talk about him. Because why else would we talk about all these other things we're into? He's that amazing. I was reading a a book uh, that was written about the life of uh, Smith Wigglesworth. And Wigglesworth was a revivalist about 100 years ago or so. Um, And there's a story in that book where him and his nephew are driving down the road. And all of a sudden, Smith goes, hey, I need you to pull over. And the uh, nephew's going, man, this must be like an emergency. Okay, I'm going to pull over. And he pulls over really fast. And all of a sudden, Smith just goes, Jesus, I'm so sorry that we've talked about everything but you over the last 20 minutes. Will you forgive us? And for the rest of that car ride, they just talked about Jesus. I remember reading that and being like, man, I want to be like that. I want to be so sensitive to Jesus. I want to talk about Jesus so much that I feel it in my spirit when I've drifted, when he hasn't become the center of my focus and my attention. See, that's what it is to follow Jesus. He becomes the most important thing, and it doesn't matter what you're into. And be blessed in that stuff. I don't care what you're into. Thank you. Go do it. But we bond. We live life together because of him, Right? So I don't go to church because everybody in this church is really into cycling or mountain climbing or camping, okay? This isn't the church that's uh, into sports or knitting or crafting, okay? Like, I, I'm not looking for a life group of people of common interest. I'm looking for people who love Jesus. I'm looking for people who are passionate for Jesus because that's the people I want to spend my time with. And that's how Jesus builds his church. Matthew 16, 13 through 18, it says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said to him, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others uh, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? This is a key moment in the Gospels. And Paul or Peter responds, Simon Peter replies, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood had not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So there's a little bit of debate over what Jesus meant by this rock. Is he talking about Peter? That word Peter in the Greek means rock or it means stone. Um, is it talking about the revelation that Peter just gave? Is Jesus talking about himself? Some would argue that Jesus is saying, you're Peter, and on this rock, I'm going to build my church. Which makes sense, because then you read other scriptures, and Jesus said, I'm the chief cornerstone. The church is founded on the apostles and prophets, me being the chief cornerstone, Christ being the chief cornerstone. That makes sense. What I believe is going on here is it's kind of all three mixed together. Jesus is saying, you, Peter, are now a prophetic image of the rock of revelation of who I am. Now, we know that Peter is not much of a rock, right? Like, even right after this, the same chapter, you just keep reading, and all of a sudden, Jesus is like, Peter, you're Satan, okay? Okay. Like, he kind of screws up. Later on, he's going to deny Jesus. Even when, he becomes, even when he becomes an apostle, later on, what's going to happen uh, is he's going to be rebuked by Paul. It says that Peter stood condemned for something he did. Okay, there's these moments where he is not a rock in the flesh. But what does it say? This was revealed by my Father who is in heaven, that Peter got a revelation. And when Peter gets revelations, things change. You are saved because of a revelation that Peter got about the Gentiles coming into Christianity, being able to be saved. See, I believe that that's the rock. It's this revelation of who Jesus is. So first and foremost, if you are going to be a disciple of Jesus, this me and Jesus thing is you make that declaration. You believe this with all of your heart that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. This is who Jesus is. Amen? Amen. All right. We're there. Good. Let's keep rolling. I believe that Jesus is going to build his church on this declaration. But here's the problem in American Christianity is for the most part, we have not built our Uh, church or thought about our church growth in the way that Jesus thinks about it. I was praying a few weeks ago, and I was just asking God questions about, okay, God, how do we lead the church in this season? What are you doing? And I felt like God said this. He goes, Chris, I build my church on disciples, not on attendance. I build my church on disciples, not on attendance. And here's what I felt like God was getting at, 
is if you're measuring church growth or a healthy church, usually the measuring tools that the church has used in the West is attendance, budget, and building. So if a lot of people are showing up to your Sunday morning gathering and it's growing, way to go. Your attendance, it's a healthy church, you're growing. Okay? If your budget's growing because more people are coming, more people are giving an offering, you're a healthy church, you're building the church. And if you need a new building because you can't fit everyone who wants to come, you are growing, you're a healthy church. I feel like Jesus is saying, that's not how I build my church. Yeah. You might have built your church that way, but that's not how I'm building my church. Yeah. I'm building my church on disciples. Disciples, first and foremost, they go, Jesus, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is who you are. I know you. This is the revelation of you. Now, Throughout the Gospels, you're going to read a lot about Jesus being amazing. Like, he's going to do a lot of really cool stuff, right? He's going to uh, have compassion on all the people and heal all the sick in a village. Isn't that amazing? He just loves people so much. He's like, bring everybody to me. I don't care how long it takes. I'm going to pray for everyone. They're all going to get healed. Jesus is welcoming little children. Disciples are like, hey, those kids can't come. Jesus is like, no, no, bring them. Bring them in. He's going to weep with a woman whose brother had just died. Even though he knows in about 30 minutes he's going to raise her from the dead. He's still going to have compassion of her. He's going to empathize with her pain. He's going to weep with her. That's who Jesus is. He calms storms. He welcomes everyone. He stops someone from being stoned from their sin and picks them back up again and lifts them into a new place. Like this is who Jesus is. This is who we follow. This is who we know. But Jesus gave some really strict instructions about what it meant to truly follow him. And there's a very narrow road for those who will truly be his disciples. Here's what he says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34. He says, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Man, that's hard, isn't it? Like that's, that's part of the Bible that we kind of just real quick skip over, right? Oh, yeah, I read it, but I didn't meditate on it. <laughs> I didn't let that, like, infect my soul. I didn't go, man, Jesus, you just said that if I love my mom or my dad or my kids or my wife more than you, I'm unworthy of you. Oh, God, what's going on in my heart? Okay, can I say that's true? Can I say that you're here and everyone else is here? Because if I can't say that, what you just said is I'm unworthy of you. Because that's intense. Like, look at the next part. He's like, and whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. I mean, Jesus said that no greater love has a man shown than a man laid down his life for his brother. Jesus like, I'm about to go do that. And if you're not willing to do the same thing, you're not worthy of me. If you're not willing to take up your cross, if you're not willing to lay down your life for me, that same love that I expressed to you on Calvary, if you're not willing to do that, you're unworthy of me. It's pretty intense. But that's the call of discipleship. The call of discipleship is I deny myself. I go, Jesus, you, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and no matter what it costs me, I follow you. No matter what it takes, no matter what, what obstacles I have to walk through, no matter what hardship, no matter if you don't do the very thing I've been praying for you to do, I'm with you. And if you can't say that, you're unworthy of them. That's what Jesus says. That's intense. Jesus also says in another part of the Gospels, he says that there are going to be many people who are going to say, Lord, Lord. They're going to say, they're going to go, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? They declared who he was. Did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not uh, pray for the sick and they were healed? Did we uh, not cast out demons? And he goes, yeah, you did, but I never knew you. And so be gone from me. See, so I have this conviction that the Bible says that whoever uh, thinks to instruct the church through the word of God, they're going to be judged more harshly. So I'm standing up here and I'm making a choice to be judged more harshly by the way I teach this. And if I don't teach all of this, if I only teach the parts that I really enjoy talking about and you all get really excited about, Jesus is going to go, you didn't do what I asked you to do. And I'm going to be judged more harshly. See, there are things that Jesus said that we don't feel comfortable with. 
Like, we don't feel comfortable with that. Jesus, but you told me to love everybody, and you're now saying that there's going to be war in my own household because I chose to follow you. And Jesus is like, that's absolutely true. And you can now love your enemies who used to be your father, who used to be your brother, who used to be your son. There's not going to be tension in your household because of me. Are you still going to follow me? Are you still going to trust in me? Like, have you ever read through this book and been like, I do not feel comfortable with that? You know what I'm talking about? Like, read through the Old Testament. Just, like, get, like, um, five pages in. Right? Like, there's this part where the Israelites are coming into the promised land. Everyone's celebrating. Woo! God's doing it. It's amazing. And he parts the sea, and they walk through it. He parts the Jordan River. They walk through it. There's this tabernacle they set up. It's amazing. And then they're about to face their first battle. And God's like, hey, when you go in there, kill everyone. Man, woman, and child. Everyone. And then they do it. Now, looking back on it, you can be like, well, you know, I mean, that's not me. I live in the New Testament. Praise God, New Covenant. (laughs) But God did that. God instructed that. Now, think about the person, the man who held that sword. And he walks into a house, and there's a family there with little kids. And what's the command of God? Kill everyone. So following God in that moment is doing something that all of us would probably feel nauseated of. That's God. So when I approach this and I read these things, I'm not going to skip over that stuff. You want to know why? Because i got to go, Jesus, your ways are higher than my ways. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I don't get it. And I wouldn't have done it that way. But I'm not God. You are. Your ways are higher than my ways, and so I submit to you and I surrender to you. That's that's part of being a follower of Jesus, is that it's not about what you want. It's not about your morality. It's not about your definition of love. It's you follow the one who defines love. You follow the one who defines compassion and gentleness and kindness. And if it's outside your box, guess what? That's kind of how the Bible works. Like, Moses did not receive the burning bush. He's like, it's about time. I knew I was going to be the deliverer. In fact, I've got a list of plagues I think we should do. Why don't we co- uh, collaborate on this? Like Moses is like, are you kidding? I don't want to do that. Like think about David. He's like, oh, I'm going to be king. This is great. You know, just thinking triumphal entry, you know, banners, parade, sit down at the throne. Oh, no, you're going to be chased around by your father-in-law who's going to kill you. And the only people who are going to get on your side are all the disgruntled and indebted. How would you like those to be your best friends? If you've been around disgruntled people, that's hard. And now I'm going to spend years getting chased around, estranged from my wife. When I actually do come back, she's going to reject me. And now I have to, now now that's off the table, this woman I love. So, oh, that's that's pretty hard. David didn't like his, his path either. Or New Testament. Jesus, one of the last things he says to Peter is like, hey, Peter, by the way, one day you're not going to clothe yourself. Someone else is going to. You're not going to feed yourself. You're going to be put in chains, and you're going to die for me. That's what I have for you. That's what following me is all about for you. And Peter's like, what about this guy? What about John? Like, have you ever done that? Have you ever been like, God's calling you into something hard? And you're like, well, what about all these other people? Why do I have to sell my house? They don't have to sell their house. And then we start justifying, well, maybe maybe I missed it. Maybe that's not right, because it's not comfortable. You know what Jesus says to Peter? He's like, don't worry about him. If he lives till I come back, what's that to you? You follow me. Ooh, it's a hard word, guys. It's a hard word. So what does that mean for you? Like, if you're walking through some hardship, all of a sudden that you kind of look around, side, going, God, this is not what I signed up for. Like, well, they don't have to do that. Why do I have to walk through this hardship? Why do they get blessed and I don't? I mean, we all have this journey, guys. And the answer is always the same. It's surrender and going, you know what, Jesus, I follow you no matter what the cost. So I'm, again, coming before you and going, where else can I go? Where else can I go? Disciples face this in John chapter 6. I love John chapter 6. It's like a highlight reel of Jesus, some of Jesus' best moments. This is the one where Jesus feeds the 5,000. He preaches to the crowd. They all get hungry. And Jesus is like, you know what? Dinner's on me. Boom. Everyone gets food. It's amazing. The crowd's going wild. He just taught like no one's ever taught before. He's feeding us miraculously. He tells the disciples to go get in a boat and go to the other side. They do it. Um, and then he walks on the water to join them. Isn't that amazing? I mean, this is the walking on the water chapter. And the crowd notices that he's on the other side. They don't know how he got there. So 5,000 people walk around this lake to go be with Jesus again. 
He's got them. He's got his church of 5,000, praise God. He grew his attendance. And then Jesus says some stuff to them, discerning that they're only there because of the miracles that he was working among them. He says, if you don't, actually, let's read it together so you know this is true. John 6, 53 through 54. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. That's what he tells the crowd. You got to eat my flesh, and you got to drink my blood. Now, if you're sitting in the seats, are you like, man, we were with you right up until that moment? <laughs> Miracles, I'm in. Food, I'm in. Teaching, I'm in. You just told me I got to drink your blood. I'm out. <laughs> now, if you're one of the disciples, aren't you going, Jesus, tell them it's a metaphor. Like, tell, come on, finish it up. Balance that statement. Tell them, tell them what you really mean. Come on. And you know what Jesus does? He notices and he looks at them and says, are you offended by what I just said? And then he reiterates it <laughs> to the point where it says, and even some of his disciples walked away. We're not talking about the 12. We're talking about within the 70. Some of his disciples walked away. Guys, that is the very, very opposite strategy of how we build the American church. Like absolute opposite. Some of your main leaders walk away and you don't explain it to them. That's how Jesus grew his ministry. He didn't qualify it. He just let them have it. And then he looks at the 12, and this is what he says to them. And after many of his disciples had turned back and no longer had walked with him, this is John 6. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Like instead of looking at 12, he's like, you guys know my heart. You know who I really am. I know this is hard, but trust me. Jesus didn't say that. He looks at him and goes, do you guys want to leave? You want to follow your friends, people that traveled with us on the road, you probably built rapport with? You guys probably had those late night campfire meetings sharing your heart and your dreams. He's like, all those people left. You want to go with them? You want to go? Again, Jesus is not building the church the way I would have. And then Peter has another one of his amazing moments. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I'm in. I don't get it. I don't understand why you just said that. I don't know what that's going to mean in the future for what we have to do, but I'm in, in the 12th day. Now, I don't know what Peter was thinking in this moment. Maybe he's thinking he's going to get another one of those moments where it's like, and you are Peter, you know, and now you're the leader, and now your hands are going to glow like fire, and you're going to lay hands on people, and they're going to be healed. Like, I don't know what Peter was expecting. I think he was expecting another encouragement. Instead, this is what Jesus did. He looked at the 12, and he goes, one of you is a devil, and then he left. So Peter just gives this, to whom else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And then Jesus looks right at him, and he goes, and one of you is the devil, talking of Jews. But they don't know that. It's not like, way to go, team. You're with me. I knew it. It says something else that would push them away. Because following Jesus is hard. It's really hard. And it's why this is a narrow road. See, not everyone's going to make it. And if I have a, if I have a fear, here's what, here's what my fear would be about the church, is that I would stand up here and I would preach God's word, and not once would you ever feel the conviction in your spirit if you're not really a disciple of Jesus, that you're not. Now, I don't want you to doubt your salvation I don't want to do that at all, but what I don't want to do is make you feel like you can just kind of skip through life and be excited about Jesus and then kind of do your own thing, because that's not what the Bible teaches. And another hard word is that Jesus says that all those who are not followers of his, he is the only way, the only truth, the only life. He's the only door to the Father. And if you're not a disciple of his, if you won't do what he says to do in following him, surrender, lay down your life, deny yourself, take up your cross, then what he says is that there's a place of eternal torment and punishment. And that place is called hell, and we don't like talking about that at church, but that's real, and Jesus talks about it a lot. And he talks about it a lot to the crowd. He doesn't just bring his disciples close and talk about it. Because there's a fear of the Lord that comes out of Jesus' teachings that goes, there is a punishment for all those who deny me and who won't follow me. And you can sit in church for years, I believe, and not hear someone challenge you in the way that you're thinking about your faith. 
We have to follow him, guys. Like, we have to give it all to him. We have to, we have to get on our knees daily. And we have to go, Jesus, you have my life again today. And I have dreams and I have hopes and I have desires and I have things that I want to happen. Um, but you know what? If that's not what you have for me, I'll follow you anyways. And I'm not going to cherry pick your word to find the things that I like in it. Because I think there's almost an apathy over the things we don't like. Like, we read this and we're like, well, let's get that one. Okay. Oh, like that one. Ooh, some of the red letters, good, some not so good. And, and we don't put everything on our coffee cups, do we? But why shouldn't we? Like, I mean, Jesus said one of his most profound revelations of the Father, he goes, don't fear the one who can just kill you in this life. Fear the one who can destroy your soul. He's like, and my Father loves you. But he can also destroy your soul. Don't put that one on a coffee cup, do you? Because this is what it is to follow Jesus. It's to go low and say, Jesus, you're everything. And I put you way above everything else in my life. And so if you call me to sell my house, if you call me to drop out of school, if you call me to go pursue uh, an education that I don't really want, I'm in. And here's just a challenge for you. If following Jesus has looked pretty easy for you right now, I would question if you're actually following him. Because it's never easy in Scripture, like ever. Like Paul's calling into his ministry was, I'm going to send him as an apostle to the Gentiles and show him how much he will suffer for me. I've anointed you to be the messenger to the Gentiles of the good news of the gospel, and you're going to suffer for me. Congratulations. Welcome to the team. Guys, this is tough. This is tough. But this is how Jesus builds his church. And we can't build his church on attendance. We have to build his church on people who deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow him, who say, Jesus, you're the most important thing to me. I'm in 100%. You say your church is worth being a part of. I'm in. I'm going to be a member. And this isn't optional anymore. This isn't I don't feel like it today. This isn't, well, I don't really get anything out of it. It's not about us anymore. We choose to follow him. And that's it. I already have a yes in my heart. You ask me to do something, there's already a yes there because I chose to deny myself. Like, I make that choice daily. It's already there. You tell me to go do something, I'm in. Guys, God's not a debater. And God, God's not someone who's going to negotiate what following him really means. Like, the rich young ruler didn't have the opportunity to go, hey, what if I gave 10%? You said everything, 10%. God, and Jesus is like, mm, 75. 25. 50. 50. Deal. I'm in. Like, that's not how the kingdom works. But I think oftentimes, without realizing it, we do that with God. Hey, God, I'll give this up, but I don't want to give that up. That's precious to me. God, I'll make this arrangement with you, but I really don't want to have to lose this. I really enjoy this. Please don't make me have that conversation. Please don't make me say that. Please don't make me make that choice. Like, that's not how it works with God. He's God. We're not. His ways are higher than our ways. And we have to learn to live a submitted lifestyle. You're a follower. I'm a follower. We follow him together. And in the New Testament, if you weren't following Jesus, it was very apparent. You just weren't with him anymore. He went somewhere, you didn't. He told you to do something, you didn't do it, he's going somewhere else. But here in the New Testament, there's so many lies, so many false teachings about what following Jesus is, it can be incredibly challenging to figure out, am I really following Jesus or not? And the only way I've ever discovered to figure this out is get on my knees and go, Jesus, you have my life again today. Today. And then every day I spend time with him. And you know what I do when I do that? When I surrender, I get free. Because in Christianity, in our faith, the way to freedom is through surrender. It's got my life's not my own anymore. It's yours to do with what you will. And you know what God does in that place? He blesses us. He gives us favor. He gives us a ministry. He gives us influence and an impact in people's lives. And it doesn't mean there's not going to be a cost and it's not going to be hard, but that's what Jesus does when we fully surrender to him as he leads us into his good purposes. It's going to be hard, but it's going to be worth it. And the whole time that we're doing this, he said, I'll be with you. You know what you get? You get the lover of your soul right there with you. Get the one who can fill you with joy and peace, the one who can cause you to sing and laugh in prison like Paul did. Like, that's who you get. 
So here's what, I'm asking you to pay a cost, but if you know what you're really getting in return, it's un the unsearchable riches of the knowledge of God. That's what you get in return. You're going to be like, God, this was nothing compared to what I got. I got you. I got you. Here's where I believe um, God will take us as the church. Acts 4, 13. The description of Peter and John before the Sanhedrin. They're being judged. And here's what the conclusion is. It says that when John, when, when they saw the boldness in Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they were recognized as having been with Jesus. You look like him, guys. We look like him. Like when we do that, when we, when we go, man, Jesus, I'm following you, he conforms us into his image, and everywhere we go, we look like Jesus. They're going to go, man, those people, they look like Jesus. That's what I, I mean, this is the guy I read about, the kind, compassionate, loving, tender one. He's like, that's what they look like now. See, that's where God takes us as he conforms us into his image as we surrender to him. As he walks with us. We look like him. And I believe that's what the church needs in this hour more than any other is those who will truly follow him and be his disciples. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take communion together. If you guys have, uh, look underneath your seat. There's a communion cup. There's a wafer on top. They're a little challenging to open, but this is COVID communion right here, guys. Individual servings. And I've never led communion this way, but I'm going to do it today. Because I've never used this passage before as we're talking about it. But inside of this cup represents his body and his blood. And Jesus said in John chapter 6, that unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you there is no life in you. But whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, obviously, we all know that communion symbolizes this, and that's what Jesus' intent always was, is that we would look to the cross to discern what he was speaking here. And communion illustrates our acceptance of the cross, but I want you to think about this. In this moment, you're surrendering your own ways, your own understanding, your own thinking, and you're going, God, I'm taking your body in and of myself. I'm eating of your flesh poured out for me. I'm drinking of your blood poured out for me. And I know it feels a little morbid, but this is what Jesus taught. This is what he taught. And as we do this, we say, Jesus, it's your way, not my way. And I surrender to you again. And so if you feel comfortable, I want to invite you to just get on your knees and surrender again to Jesus as you take communion. Let this act of communion be an act of surrender for you again. Jesus, I choose to follow you. Even when I don't understand it, even when it looks hard, even when it's difficult, I choose to follow you. I'm going to be a disciple. I'm going to deny myself and I'm going to take up my cross. I'm going to put you first in my life above everything else. God, to the point where there's no comparison of where my allegiance lies. And as the band leads us in, I'm going to pray first and then the band's going to lead us in. As they lead us in, do business with God. But make sure your heart's right with God. Make sure that surrender is authentic. And if there's anything that God brings up, hey, will you, bring, will you sacrifice this? Will you give this up? Let, let God and the Holy Spirit convict you of those things and lay them before his feet again and say, God, you can have this. You can have my life. You can have this area. You can have this relationship. You can have this thing. And allow this to be an authentic moment of surrender. So Jesus, we come before you again, God, wanting to be true disciples. Wanting to be people who confess just as Peter did. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. To whom else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. It is you and you alone who make a way to the Father. You and you alone that free us from sin, who restore us, redeem us. It is you alone who loves us to the point of sacrifice. And what you ask in return is that we would lay down our lives in the same way that you did. And God, right now, God, put us a heart in us to surrender and say yes to you again. In Jesus' name.
don't know if I'm actually ready to give Jesus permission in that spot. Or I don't know if he's quite good enough in that area. Man, that's okay. That's a part of the journey. But you see, Jesus died to give you that choice in that process. And I want to invite you, if you're working something out, man, the best place to work that out is inside of life. But with some people that you can trust. And so I want to invite you to that. Um, if you're trying to get connected right through this door as we exit, there's a, 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 some people that can kind of help you make a connection to life group that would maybe fit your life. And if you are repenting, and this is like a aha moment, I just want to say this, don't miss out on the joy and the freedom of throwing off the junk and getting Jesus. Okay? When we repent, it's not like, ah. You know, that happened, and I was like, all right, Jesus, now, now what are we doing today? <laughs> Get that light. Okay, so, so just don't miss that part. All right. All right, well, cool. Hey, there's a few things. We're shifting up a little bit. We want to encourage you. If you need prayer for anything, right back through these doors. We are no longer having a prayer team out here, but actually grab your stuff, and right back here in the lobby, we will group that take you over to the east side of the building, where there's some people that would love to pray for you. And a couple of things we felt like the Lord said this morning was, if you have been following Jesus for a while and you're hearing people talk about, hey, how do you hear God? Or how do you like talk to God? Or how do you be with God? And maybe there's just some kind of confusion or chaos. Jesus wants to meet you this morning in that place. And so I love you to invite you to come to your prayer. If you need any healing for anything physically, emotionally, spiritually, anything along those lines, would love to pray for you. Otherwise, I hope you guys enjoyed Circle 1. Next week, we got Circle 2 coming in hot. It's going to be my second favorite because my first favorite is Jesus. But it gets better. So it's, I mean, crazy. But hey, thank y'all for being here. I hope you enjoy your life. Don't forget to dominate 2020. And let's get this. All right, y'all have a great week.